Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School Experts in Policy, Planning, and Health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to another episode of EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapiro, the Associate Dean of Faculty at the Blaustein School, and the purpose of this podcast is to talk with my colleagues about issues affecting people in New Jersey, the United States, and the world. Today, we're returning to the topic of the health impacts of COVID-19, particularly the disparities in those impacts across race and across socioeconomic status, a topic mentioned a few episodes ago by Dr. Sabiha Hussein in the RWJ uh, Intensive Care Unit. I'm talking today to my colleague, Professor Dawn Muzan, an expert in health disparity. Dawn, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your research on health disparities? Um, sure. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I study physical and mental health disparities among populations of African descent. So I study the negative health effects of racial discrimination, goal striving stress, poverty, and intimate partner violence. But in addition to studying those traditional risk factors for poor health, I study how protective factors like social relationships, religious involvement, racial identity, and coping shape physical and mental health among Black Americans. And I also spend a lot of time understanding and communicating information about the heterogeneous nature of Black communities in terms of ethnicity. So how African Americans may differ from Afro Caribbeans and from those with direct ancestry, and also how the Black immigrant experience in the U.S. is both similar to and very distinct from the experience of African Americans in this country. And I came into the field of health disparities because my paternal grandmother died of a preventable illness related to poverty at age thirty-eight, age thirty-eight, which made me passionate about finding ways to end premature death among historically marginalized groups. Great. Um, when we think about people being in good health, you know, when we have the sort of lay interpretation of that, we think, oh, that person has a good diet, they don't smoke, they don't drink, uh, they go see good doctors, but a lot more goes into people being healthy. How do socioeconomic factors play a role in how healthy a person is? Um, so I'm really glad you asked this question because it's one I hear a lot and it's a common topic I discuss with students in my class. So my short answer is that yes, each of those factors matter individually, but I really see those factors as being inextricably linked to each other. So good health, a good diet and healthy behaviors are shaped by socioeconomic factors. Um, so I'm trained as a medical sociologist and we often talk about constrained choices that many low income people and people of color face. And a common explanation that people give for health disparities is health behaviors. If only those people over there would do better, if only they would eat better, if they would value their health more, and so on. But that assumes that every person has the same range of healthy opportunities available to them. And we, we know that that's simply not the case. And that's where socioeconomic factors come into play. So if you think of neighborhood socioeconomic status, if you live in a low-income, under-resourced neighborhood, there's likely no full-scale supermarket where you can buy fresh produce, so you don't even have the option to buy fresh fruits and vegetables if you wanted to. You have to rely on small neighborhood stores that largely specialize in canned goods and box goods. And likewise, in that same under-resourced neighborhood, it may be unsafe for children to exercise in the park, or there may not be safe sidewalks on which to walk or run. So in both of those cases, healthy choices are constrained and oftentimes not within one's reach at all. And at the individual level, socioeconomic factors like income, of course, determine whether you can afford to buy healthy food or instead need to rely on cheap and unhealthy food. So you may know it's in your best interest to buy ingredients for an arugula salad, but if that costs $10 for one or two people and you can buy a frozen family meal that's more filling for $6, your choices are constrained. The unhealthy choice is more within your reach. And if right. you're struggling to keep your lights on, you can't afford a gym membership. So your exercise choices are constrained as well. So, so when I hear this question, my, my, um, my main response is your own personal socioeconomic resources, coupled with the resources available within your neighborhood, help to shape the extent to which people are able to make healthy choices regarding diet, exercise, smoking, drinking, and so on. 
and I always have emphasized in my courses and in my research that it's imperative to consider social context when ex- investigating health inequities because otherwise it's just a slippery slope into simply blaming people for their poor health outcomes. Yeah, and that's a, such an m- important misconception to correct. I mean, even the Surgeon General of the United mm-hmm. States a couple of weeks ago was talking about how people need to take responsibility for their health. And if we ignore the factors that you're talking about, we sort of say to the government, okay, well, you don't have to deal with this problem. It's a personal issue. It's not a structural issue. If we admit it's a structural issue, then we have to do something about it. Am I sort of getting that right? I I think you're exactly getting that right. And that that was a very disappointing moment for many uh, people (laughs) who study the things I do. And there were lots of think pieces written about that um, because yeah, it really, it, there's no room for policy intervention if we can just blame people for making bad decisions, as opposed to looking to the, the, the range of decisions they have available to them. And I think, I think you, you hit it right on the, on the head with that one. So turning to our, our current crisis, COVID-19 has, has clearly hit hardest upon racial minorities. Um, I saw one number this past weekend that in New York, uh, the uh, black people were twice as likely to die as white people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's controlling for everything else, controlling for income, controlling for all those other stuff. What's wh- what is your best explanation for this? Well, yeah, there there are so many explanations. I'd say probably the leading explanation right now has to do with the fact that people of color, almost across the board, have disproportionately high rates of con- of chronic conditions, which are often comorbid and co-occur together. Uh, The CDC lists 10 risk factors for COVID-19, including things like asthma, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and kidney disease. And and, Blacks and Latinos have the highest rates of those conditions, leaving them especially vulnerable, not only to acquiring COVID-19 in the first place, but these health conditions also mean that their recovery rates are lower than those of whites. And poverty and racial discrimination at the individual and institutional levels leads to cumulative stress over the life course, which we know also impairs the immune system and raises the risk of illness. Um, so all these risk factors translate into higher vulnerability for acquiring COVID-19 in the first place. Um, but besides that biomedical risk factors, there are a bunch of other risk factors that predispose people of color to COVID-19. And I would characterize those as largely social rather than biomedical. And I won't talk about all of them, but I just want to talk about probably two of them. Um, Housing inequality is one of those factors. So we know that population density is a major risk factor for COVID-19 in the form of crowded living conditions, both in terms of housing structure and housing composition. Um, So given the long legacy of racial residential segregation, Blacks and Latinos are far less likely to live in single family homes and far more likely to live in apartment buildings and high rise complexes that involve more unavoidable daily human contact with neighbors. And um, to compound compound that issue, um, because of poverty, people of color tend to have larger household sizes, often in what we call vertical living arrangements with multiple generations in a single household. So in those circumstances, it becomes harder to contain the virus if one person in the household catches it. And because many of these households are multi-generational, older family members become most vulnerable. And there are many others I can name, but I'll just name one more in the interest of time. Um, A second social risk factor is that Blacks and Latinos are largely concentrated in low-wage jobs within the service industry, for which working at home, even taking paid sick leave is not a possibility. And these are problems because they pose at least two additional risk factors for acquiring the virus. So for those in essential jobs, they have increased contact with the public. And because there's no paid leave, they're less likely to stay home when they're sick because they need the income, quite frankly, to keep their lights on. So those factors increase the risk of acquiring infection in the first place. Yeah, it's sort of a double whammy there. Uh, Poor people, particularly minorities, are both more likely to get sick in the first place and then less likely to get adequate care once they get sick. Um, right. let, let's go through these and you've talked a fair amount about them any, or, already, but I want to go in a little more detail. Um, let, let's talk about the first of these prongs, um, and thinking about what we can do about mm-hmm. them, um, in terms of making it less likely that people get sick in the first place, what can we do in terms of prevention to protect the most vulnerable members of society? Um, I think in, in order to 
sort of affect any real and lasting change in building what I think should be a goal for all of us, which is a more equitable society. I think it would really require a drastic reorganization of our society's current arrangement. So this is just a pie in the sky thought. (laughs) But for those, those with the most resources would just have to be willing to give up a little bit more. So the 90 to 99 percent of us who are remaining have more equal access to health and economic opportunities. And we see this type of economic organization in other wealthy democracies. But the question, of course, is whether we as a nation have the political will to execute that level of redistribution. Um, but on a more realistic level in the short term. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, <laughs> yeah, that's, just, that's my pie in the sky hope. But and You're allowed to have that. Yeah. Thank you. I got to hold on to that. Um, I think we can definitely increase our efforts to provide a basic living wage to workers. I mean, it took only it seemed like one to two weeks of this pandemic for people to reach like total economic devastation. So Americans need more financial cushion in their budgets in order to be able to withstand any economic shock, whether individual individual level shock, like having a car that broke down or collective shock, like we've seen with COVID-19 in the form of massive job loss. And I think we can also provide universal health care like our other wealthy democratic peer nations. I'm not alone, hopefully, in thinking health care should be viewed as a basic human right, not something that only some people deserve. And go ahead, go ahead. So that um, that turns to that second prong and sort of mm-hmm. making sure we care for people better. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, given the enormous job loss we've witnessed in the past few months, I think it's, it makes sense that Americans' health coverage not be tied to their places of employment. So we've seen millions of people who lost their jobs due to the virus, but also as a result, lost their health insurance. So I share the belief of many others that we need to design a system in which employment and health insurance are not inextricably linked. So that's one factor. Um, I also think we need to ensure that there's universal free testing available to everyone, regardless of insurance status or citizenship status, and that these sites are available in all communities. So we, we all have shared risks, so we cannot afford to leave any communities behind. I think we're slowly getting there, but there are miles to go, so to speak, before we sleep. Um, I think uh, we need more rapid testing so people diagnosed as positive with COVID-19 can self-quarantine and contact tracing can be initiated as quickly as possible. And we need these rapid results, especially for people with pre-existing conditions, so that accessible pathways to care can be developed so that these vulnerable residents don't fall through the cracks. Yeah, I mean, obviously, everyone talks about testing, and that's going to to be a, a key component. Um, and well, I mean, my view is that testing is necessary, but not sufficient to get us there. We have to have it, um, but it's not by itself going to get us uh, to where we need to, uh, to, to be to recover from this. Um, ideally, eventually, we're going to need treatments and we're going to need a yep. vaccine. Yep. And I'm guessing most of these issues of disparities we're going to have to really watch out for as treatments and vaccines are developed as well. Right. I I think we have to be attentive to the potential for inequities at each stage of the process. So we were just talking about testing, but also in terms of being sure that those pathways to affordable and accessible care are made available to, uh, you know, our most disadvantaged and marginalized populations. And New York Times, actually CDC recently um, released a statement saying that healthcare providers should be available of, I'm sorry, be made aware of the potential biases they may uh, be perpetuating in the clinical encounter. Um, And I think that was largely in response to some of the media coverage about um, Black patients specifically seeking testing and being turned away and then later dying. So we need to be careful to attend to not just once we eliminate hopefully testing disparities that we are also aware of and responsive to disparities regarding treatment follow-up and so on so all across the path yeah the the turning away for testing is just it's appalling and it's um, and, you know, to some extent, I'm sure it's unconscious bias, right. um, uh, but it, it's there and we need to be aware of it. There was also data I saw that, you know, when 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 African-Americans complain about pain, they're less likely to yep. get medications than, yep. uh, than more affluent and, and white uh, uh, patients. And so yep. it, 
if that's what happens when we have a treatment for COVID, you know, this is right. not going to go away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that in terms of pain. We've seen that in terms of maternal and child health. Uh, right. You know, black women going for, you know, labor and uh, their symptoms and their complaints being disregarded. And we, I mean, we even right. saw this with Serena Williams. And, and right. that, that is really, I talk a lot about this and other, other medical sociologists talk about diminishing returns in, to health. So you would think the idea is that once, you know, even the most disadvantaged group, once you reach a certain socioeconomic level, then health disparities should go away. But if you're Serena Williams and you're still having, you know, access to care problems or quality of care problems, then, you know, there's a, there's a problem. Right. I mean, it, that, that takes away the argument that, oh, it's just income. Exactly. Exactly. So we need to be attentive to socioeconomic disparities and de- certainly design policies for that. But we also have to realize that racism also comes into play and compounds the issue further. Right. So um, obviously the, uh, you know, the COVID-19, we're still in the middle of it. We don't know exactly how it's, you know, how it's going to play out. A lot of people have guesses and ideas. Um but we can already start to, I think, hopefully draw lessons from it. And if we were to take lessons from this awful experience, what would you like them to be? Um, that's a great question. I, I think, I really hope that as a nation, we begin exercising the humility to learn from other countries, not just about how they're man- managing the pandemic, but more broadly in terms of how they organize their societies. Um, so since we're talking about health here, the most obvious solution is to find a way to provide universal health care for all. It should be a basic human right, full stop. Um, we need to raise the bottom on population health for people of color and low income people so they don't develop chronic illnesses prematurely at the rate they do. There's some studies showing that for black people specifically, that they develop chronic conditions on average 10 years earlier than whites. And so premature death matters, not just for the families who are left behind, but also in terms of lost productivity to the economy and in terms of the ability to pass down intergenerational wealth. So I think that matters. But even beyond health, um, I think what we're learning here is that what many of us knew all along is that the social safety net in the U.S. is woefully inadequate. People were put out of work, had little savings to get by. There's still millions of Americans waiting to be approved for unemployment. And the federal government provided a one-time stimulus of $1,200. But if we learn to exercise the humility at looking at, by looking at other countries, we can look at our Northern neighbors, Canadians who became unemployed Mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID-19 are now eligible for $2,000 per month for four months with an additional payment, I think of $300 per child. And even college students in Canada are eligible for $1,250 per month for four months. So having this sort of steady short-term economic transfer will keep Americans from becoming housing or food insecure. And because healthcare in Canada is not tied to employment, those who lost their job don't have to worry about being unable to afford care. So I think that's one important thing we could learn if, from this terrible exercise. And yeah, I'll stop there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that you used humility there because mm-hmm. certainly... Um, you know, it's uh, we have not the only things we've been the leaders in, in in the COVID-19 crisis is the total number of cases and total number totally of deaths. Agree. And, totally agree. Totally uh, agree. I mean, I, I don't know that that's where it'll be when all is said and done. I think the developing world is going to have a horrible time. Mm-hmm. But right now, that's that's where we are. And that's not where we should be. Um Thank you very much, Professor Muzan, for coming on today. This has been, uh, I think, very educational and, uh, and very helpful to our listeners. Thank you for having me. It was a great time. Uh, I'd also like to, to give a thank you to our production team, Tamara Swedberg, Amy Cobb, and Karen Olson. We'll be back next week with another talk from another expert at the Blaustein School. Talk to you then. <laughs>